to um, welcome Christy Nuerangelo um, for Grand Rounds today. We're very excited to have you all the way from Delaware. So um, just a little background, uh, Christy graduated from the State University of New York, Albany, uh, where she received her Master of Social Work, and then she has an MBA from Iona College, and she's also a, a diplomat of the Academy of Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. So we're very excited to have her present today on cognitive behavioral therapy. So um, I will turn it over to you, Christy, and thanks again for being here. Thanks so much for having me. Okay, so thank you everybody for having me today. Um, what, what we'll do is if you can hold the questions until the end of um, my spiel, that would be helpful. Then I can kind of go through them um, just to make sure that I don't miss anything on the chat. I know there's a little chat section here. I'm new to, to Zoom. Usually I'm, I'm use, using my telehealth platform, which is a little bit different uh, than, than the Zoom platform. Um, but I'm excited to be here today and I'm hoping that I can answer all of your questions and give you a good understanding of cognitive behavioral therapy and how we use it specifically in substance use disorders. Um, there's a lot to say about CBT and it's something that um, is very exciting for me and really a modality of treatment that clicked. Um, I think everybody has their niche in what they really love to do. And when I found CBT, uh, it was really kind of spoke to me and um, I've been able to emerge myself in that modality and pretty much solely use CBT in my practice today. So we'll start with talking a little bit about the history of CBT. So this is a picture of Dr. Aaron Beck. Um, Dr. Aaron Beck actually um, passed this past November, he was 100 years old. And up until his very last few years, he was still coming into all of the training classes that were held up before COVID at the Beck Institute. Um, and he would come in and he would role play. And it was amazing and a really great experience to work with Dr. Beck. Um, now his daughter, Judith Beck, runs the uh, organization, the Beck Institute, and her daughter, who is a um, therapist also is working um, in the foundation as well. So really Dr. Aaron Beck is the founder, he's considered the father of CBT. Um, he went to Brown University, then he went to Yale University and he became a psychiatrist at the University of Pennsylvania. And while he was working there and he was prescribing um, traditional medication management for patients and at that point, um, you know, back back a while back when psychiatrists were still engaging in psychoanalytic treatment, he really noticed that his patients weren't getting better. So he started to have this hypothesis that we have a thought or situation, then we have an automatic thought, then we have a feeling, and then we have a behavior. So he started to do some of these different tests and behavioral experiments that turned into clinical trials which led him in 1977 uh, to do his first clinical trial, so where he compared CBT to the use of antidepressants. So he took a group of patients that were just solely using cognitive behavioral therapy techniques, and he took a patient, group of patients that were uh, solely using antidepressant medications, and he focused it in the beginning just on treating depressed patients. And he noticed that the CBT patients actually had a significant improvement in their symptoms, um, almost more than what he was seeing with patients treated with antidepressants alone. Now we can argue that patients were, were the patients with or without um, therapy when they were using the antidepressants. Um, some were, some weren't. So he has, you can certainly pull those studies up. There's a lot in there. Um, that talks about his first few years of his clinical trials. Um, since then, he's co-authored over 25 books, about 600 articles, and he has numerous achievement awards. Um, so he's really the, the leading, the world's leading researcher of psychopathology um, and our founder of, of CBT. So what exactly is cognitive behavioral therapy? Um, cognitive behavioral therapy, we use it very loosely in the therapeutic world, right? So you'll see a lot of providers um, look at their profiles, especially in the outpatient world, 
um, or the individual therapy world, and you'll see the modality that they'll select of CBT. What does that exactly mean? Um, well, CBT, the specific course of treatment of CBT, which we'll get into in just a little bit, um, we have a foundation, the Academy of Cognitive and Behavioral Therapies, um, which has diplomats over 130 countries worldwide. So I'm currently the only diplomat in Delaware. Um, we are always recruiting for, for more diplomats, and um, we'll talk a little bit about that training in just a few minutes. But over the last several years, since this first trial in 1977, there's been over 2,000 clinical trials worldwide using cognitive behavioral therapy and many different um, models of treatment engaged in, in with motivational interviewing or with um, psychodynamic or psycho, psychoanalytic um, behavioral therapies. So it's been, it's been kind of used in such a broad perspective throughout the country, throughout the world, um, but in most countries, we base a lot of our findings on those clinical trials. So basically, when we're looking at CBT, we're trying to examine what those inaccurate thoughts are and what those negative core beliefs are. The idea is that we want to be able to get to those negative core beliefs. The belief that those negative core beliefs is what's driving the behavior of our patients. So if you think about it through um, being able to identify and modify thinking errors, right? Thinking errors such as catastrophizing, black and white thinking, um, all of the different things that, that you've all heard of, right? Um, diminishing the positives. There's, there's a list of these thinking errors. So we wanna be able to identify these thinking errors and we wanna be able to use an evidence-based behavioral experiment um, which usually includes some type of exposure therapy that we'll get into, um, a little bit less on the addiction side. So this presentation will focus more on how we can use CBT specifically for addictions. But when you move into um, the depression category or the anxiety or the OCD aspect, exposure therapy is that traditional um, kind of course of, of treatment that we're going to be using. So CBT teaches clients these different responses to manage their thoughts and their emotions, and these skills become portable. Why is that important, right? So it's important because CBT's average length of treatment is about six to two, 22 sessions, which if you think about clients in a broader, broader picture, how, how many clients have you been seeing for years and years and years and years? True traditional CBT is not designed um, to be a longer term therapy. It's really designed to be a short term therapy, very acute symptom management and teaching clients to um, identify and to be able to use different tools and skills and allow those skills to become portable. Once they become portable, then you can apply them to many different areas of your life. And you can use these skills repetitively throughout your life in different aspects and hopefully get the response that you got when you were in treatment. So this is, in it, this is a picture, um, that's me with Dr. Beck. Um, this was a couple of years, I think, before COVID hit. Um, I did have the luxury of being able to practice role-playing with him um, several occasions. I spent a lot of time training at the Beck Institute. Um, actually, all my training has been through the Beck Institute. Um, and so he would, he would come in to these trainings and you would have an opportunity to present a case to Dr. Beck. And even though he was um, in his mid to late nineties, he was really able to, he was sharp as a tack um, and he was great to, to speak to and um, really to have that opportunity to watch him, watch him work. Um, traditional CBT is a little bit different than isolating that implementation of CBT techniques. So if you're not engaged in that structure of very specific structured sessions, the goal-oriented, time-limited therapy, um, it's, it's probably better to say, I'm going to use a specific uh, isolated implementation of a tool, right, which in the methadone uh, maintenance program would be more effective, especially if you're using it in a group setting or if you're, if you're meeting with your clients individually. If you're meeting with clients in one of your outpatient clinics and they're coming to you 
for individual therapy, that would be the opportunity to be able to engage in the traditional CBT. Um, so in order to use that traditional CBT, there is a number of um, hours of training that go into that and rounds of supervision. So um, the Beck Institute is, and there are many, many organizations that offer training for CBT. Um, the Beck Institute just happens to be the one that I've found um, to be the most, the most, the best in terms of best practice, the most learning and the supervision has been really superior and top notch to some other organizations that I've taken some smaller trainings at. So when you go to training, um, it's sort of like you're engaging in, in another um, college course, right? So you take these classes, there's requirements, you'll take a CBT for depression, and then you'll take CBT for anxiety disorders, and then you'll take specifically CBT for PTSD or insomnia or personality disorders, you name it, it's there. So when you go to actually become licensed and you apply for that diplomat status for the Academy of Cognitive Therapy, they will require you to have a certain hours, a certain amount of hours of training and supervision. Um, so what does the supervision entail? Um, supervision is probably the most important part of really learning that traditional CBT. So when you engage in supervision, and when my clients engage in supervision with me, when I have supervisees, um, you will have a, a recording device, either you can use a cell phone these days, um, or I always traditionally use the tape recorder. Um, you'll impl implement that in your session. Some people will do an audio recording. Um, you'll record your session. You'll walk through the entire session after you met with the patient, you'll listen to your session. You'll almost do like what we used to call the process recording, but you'll identify every piece of the session, identify all of the tools that you use, um, try to identify areas that you feel like you could have improved on or areas that you felt like you did a good job on, um, and then interpret maybe what the client was um, thinking or saying and kind of helps you to pick up very specifically on the interventions and help you to correct those interventions for the future. So then you submit that tape to your supervisor. That supervisor will listen to the audio or watch the video recording. And then you'll have a session with your supervisor and you'll start, you'll go through structurally that session step by step. And the luxury of having um, that opportunity to go back and listen to your recordings are that you can go to the recording minute, uh, you know, 13 minutes and 42 seconds, and you can hone in on exactly the technique that you were using and identify how it was effective or how it wasn't effective. Um, nerve wracking, yes, um, and we'll get into some automatic thoughts, <clears throat> excuse me, and anybody, <clears throat> excuse me, that has, um, gone into supervision with me and has gone through that CBT um, training with me will have similar um, responses such as, you know, I give you a tape recorder and I want you to you tape your session. Um, it can be a little bit overwhelming um, to, to think about going into your session and, and having that tape recorder there. Obviously, when you go into those sessions, the patients are um, very, obviously, they know that you have this device in there and they've signed off on um, permission that you're able to use their, their session for training. But without those sessions, um, it would be almost impossible to really understand if you're using and executing these skills properly. So if you're interested to see what some of those sessions or those recordings look like, um, you can go out to YouTube and Google Dr. Back, um, Judith Back or Aaron Back, and there are a number of um, published recordings, uh, video recordings and audio recordings that they've done. And so you can get to kind of see a live session. Um, and that's, that's helpful to understand sort of the structure. So I mentioned that this is um, a very time limited approach to therapy, average length of treatment, six to 22 sessions, usually patients that are engaging in core CBT find some benefit and relief within that six session period. So they'll start to notice some relief of their symptoms. Um, extremely goal oriented. So session number two, we start identifying those goals and they're um, 
tangible, very specific goals. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So if you're going to use a isolated implementation of a CBT technique, um, what I've included in this presentation are examples of those techniques um, that you could use and they could be beneficial in your work with patients in the methadone maintenance kind of capacity of treatment. Um, so we'll, we'll go through those. So why do we use CBT for substance disorders? Um, number of reasons, right? We wanna be able to modify those negative core beliefs about alcohol, drugs, and craving. And we'll get into that. What does it mean to modify these negative core beliefs? We wanna be able to help allow these clients to develop some problem solving skills, coping skills. Um, obviously that's gonna help them to decrease that likelihood of self-medicating. Um, it also helps the patients to go through this grieving process of the loss of getting high, right? So it's kind of like losing their best friend. Um, as you all know, you've all been um, very well versed in treating substance disorders, um, substance use disorders. Part of that loss of getting high is a really big piece of why our clients tend to relapse time and time again. Um, they get very um, ingrained in that, that process of getting high and or drinking um, and grieving that loss isn't really something that they can comprehend. Uh, it also teaches our clients how to manage the cravings. Um, there's a lot of tools and techniques even outside the CBT that are effective for this, but we're gonna talk a little bit about specifically CBT. Prepares the clients to learn from their relapses, um, identify thinking errors, thinking errors um, specifically like, I can't go to a party without uh, drinking, right? I can't um, go to work without getting high. I can't be a good mom without um, you know, getting high in the morning. Um, those types of thinking errors. And we can help them learn from their relapses without having to go into this place of hopelessness and helplessness. We can identify high risk behaviors. Um, we can put some counter, uh, counterproductive we can identify these counterproductive behaviors with the ind individuals and we can put goals around their, their recovery. Um, learning from these relapses without going into that, that major despair is huge in terms of CBT. Um, also examines these permission giving beliefs and the permission giving beliefs, we'll, we'll spend some time talking about what those specifically are. So the big question comes into play is how, how do we use 12 steps and CBT, because there's a, uh, I don't want to call it a power struggle, but CBT therapists traditionally um, conflict with this 12 step model, right? And a lot of patients that are coming into CBT um, will say, well, I've had other CBT therapists before and they don't want me to go to, go to 12 step meetings. Every therapist has their own thought on this. Um, personally, I think that if a client is getting something out of going to a 12-step meeting, um, it really depends on who their sponsor is, who their, what their home group is, what, who the people in their group are, um, take what you get, leave the rest is sort of you know, what we talk a lot about. But you can actually use 12-step model and CBT in the same treatment modality. The big conflict comes into place with abstinent birth harm reduction because we know when you go into a 12-step meeting, we're going to want you to stay sober, right? If you, if you end up drinking or you get high, you go back, you pick up your day one chip and you start that process all over again. Again, depending on the 12-step group and your sponsor. So there are some groups, there's patients that I've treated um, that have been with a sponsor or in a a group that is okay with the identification of harm reduction as a uh, modality of being appropriate for coming into a 12-step meeting, right? So as long as you are actively identifying that you are having a problem, you are an alcoholic, you are continuously trying to make efforts to reduce that, then they'll accept you into that group. Other groups are a little bit different. Um, they may not accept harm reduction as something that they're even willing to, to talk about or accept in any way, shape or form. Um, CBT therapists traditionally have a problem with this word powerlessness, right? Well, why is that? Because CBT teaches you how, that, how the client is not powerless, right? We want to empower these clients to know that they do have power over their, their 
behavior, right? We do want to be able to say to them, it's not the medication that's helping you um, kind of get through what's going on uh, in your life and get to the next step. That's it's okay. not a higher power that's allowing you to do this. It's you. It's your own progress. It's you making decisions based on your thoughts, your behaviors, your actions. Um, so it leads us to this, this kind of issue of a higher power. What do we do with this higher power when a patient comes in and they're actively engaged in a 12-step process? Um, if you're a good CBT therapist, you're going to say, that's great. It does it help you, right? Is it helpful for you? If it's helpful for you, go there, get what you need out of it. Um, let's focus on the symptoms that you're having and step away from the idea of what you're getting in 12-step, you're getting in 12-step. The other issue that comes up, and this comes up just not in CBT, but it comes up in many different avenues of therapy are sponsors versus therapists, right? Sponsors are, so I guess some are, right? Usually not trained therapists. So a lot of clients that are relying solely on 12-step on model um, are not getting that therapeutic portion of what they might need um, to get to the next step. Now, maybe they do, right? Maybe they are able to go into 12-step meetings and they found a great sponsor and they found a great home group. And you've, especially these older um, generational, you know, people that have been in these meetings and they live, breathe, and, you know, every breath is 12-step, that has worked for them and that has allowed them to get better. Uh, what we're seeing with a lot of the newer and the younger generations is that that's not the case. And I don't know why that's happening. Is it happening because 12-step meetings are, are changing? Is it happening because our generations are changing? Um, that's, that's, I guess, would be an interesting study if somebody were to want to do a, a research project. <clears throat> so moving into what exactly does it mean to use core CBT? right? How do we use a, what is the structure of a session, right? Structure of the session is probably the most important piece that you can start out with, with, with engaging in core CBT. So in the beginning of every session, we start out with a mood check, right? And, and at the end of, um, at the end of my slides, you can, there's a link to my website. And on my website, there is actually a section called tools. And what I'll do when I have a new client come into practice with me is I will ask them to go out to the website and look at the tools and look at the specific um, tool that says, how do I prepare for a CBT session? Because what we want is our clients to come into session and we want them to be prepared for session. Because we have this time limited approach, we wanna be able to make sure that we're using that 45, 50 minutes of session to the best possible use the time that we can, right? We wanna be able to make sure that we're talking about things that are important to that client, that they're struggling with in the present time. Oftentimes you can find that your sessions go down a rabbit hole and you end up talking about something um, that you know maybe happened that specific day to a client, but you miss talking about the issue that they were struggling with for the past, past week. So the first thing that I'll, I'll always do for a client is ask them to rate their mood. We'll do a mood check, either on the anxiety scale or on the, um, in, uh, on the depression scale. Um, sometimes I'll have them do a substance abuse inventory. Um, and typically what we'll want to do, um, if you're going to get treatment at the Beck Institute, every single time you have a session, you're going to be before you see a, a before you see a therapist, you're going to be asked to fill out um, one of the back scales. Um, in in my practice, I don't have them. My clients fill out the back scales every single time we have a session. Um, usually, I'll just do a mood check, a mood rating. It saves some time, and I find that you can get the same type of benefit. Um, so zero to ten, ten being the most depressed you've been, zero being no depression at all, again, with anxiety, 10 being um, severe anxiety, zero being none. Um, and then when I'm looking at um, substance abuse, we'll gauge if it's alcohol, how many drinks did you have this week? Um, if it's heroin, how many times did you use this week? If it's cocaine, again, how many times did you use this week? Um, maybe it's none, maybe they've used every day throughout the day. Um, usually my one and only rule is obviously you're not going to come into session. Um, please don't use before you come into session and please don't drink before you come into session. A little bit more difficult to tell with telemedicine, but 
hopefully you've built that relationship and the rapport with your client enough to know that they're not going to be coming in the session with you um, drunk or high. So the first thing we wanna do is a mood check. The second piece of a structure of a CBT session is a bridge. You wanna bridge from what you talked about the last session. So in my notes, when I take a note from a client, I will always talk about um, their mood rating, the content of the session, their homework, and what we're gonna to bridge to for next session. So when we leave the session, we will always start out with kind of, I will ask the client specifically, well, what do you remember us talking about in that last session, right? What is the most important piece of last session that you took away? Um, how is this important? And, and what did it mean to you? What do you remember talking about? Sometimes the client comes in and they have absolutely no idea what we talked about last session. Um, that's not ideal but it does happen, right? Because the average of what a client walks away from when they walk out of a appointment with a therapist or a doctor um, is 40%. They take 40% on average away from that session of what you've talked about, which is important why the next step we go to setting an agenda. So typically we'll set the agenda. We'll always have the mood check on the agenda. We'll have the bridge on the agenda. We'll have um, always want to go over the homework that or the action plan um, on the agenda. And then we usually identify one or two problems that they're having. Some clients will come in and they'll have a plethora of problems that they'll want to talk about. They want to list out 15 things that they're having issues with. So my question will be to them, well, what's hurting the most? Right? What's, how do you know um, how to prioritize this. If somebody's coming in and they have six problems that they're talking about, we'll say, what are the top two that you're struggling with specifically this week? Typically, we have time to talk about one or two problems during the, that specific session. Um, then we'll go into some interventions, which is the meat of that session. And then we'll always formulate an action plan. Action plan, the homework, um, they changed over from calling it homework a couple of years back. Um, homework, that word homework sort of scared people a little bit. So now we call it an action plan. The action plan is important because your clients are not going to get better sitting with you in a session 45 to 50 minutes once a week. It's just not enough time. They're going to get better practicing these skills five, 10 minutes a day throughout the week, which is why that action plan is very important. And then finally, we want to bridge to the next session and we want to get their feedback. A big part of being a cognitive behavioral therapist is putting that ball in the client's court, right? We always want to make sure that we're not working harder than the client is. So I always will ask my clients at the end of the session, how do you think session went today? Right? What did you get out of our session today? What were the most important parts that we've um, discussed in our session today? And even more important, is there anything that I can do differently in our session next week to make sure that I'm helping you the best way that I can? Right? Because if I don't know that there's something going on with my client, if they're not... Um, telling me that they're uncomfortable talking about a specific topic or they felt like I was pushing too hard. I'm not gonna know that. And it's only gonna put a divide between myself and my client, which isn't gonna help our process working together. So this, this is interesting. Um, every clinician's most dreaded comment, right? You go to set up the agenda and the client says, I don't know what I wanna talk about today. Nothing happened, right? Okay, well, what, what went on during your week? Well, nothing really. Everything was fine this week, perfectly fine. That's gonna give us some in insight. It's gonna give us some insight into, is this client really engaged in therapy? Is this client um, not engaging with the therapist, right? Are we not meshing together? I always tell my new clients, it takes a good three to five sessions to know if it's a good fit. If we're not a good fit together, I will make sure that we can refer you to another therapist who might be a better fit for you. The worst thing we can do as therapists is keep a client in session with us and keep them as our patient if we don't fit with them. A little bit more difficult to do when you're in a structured outpatient setting, but if you're finding that you really don't mesh well with a client, the best thing you can do for that client is try to transfer that client to another therapist. Um, it, it's, it's super important, especially in building that rapport with the client, which is something so critical for um, success in CBT. 
So some of the things that we'll come up with is, um, well, should we talk about managing temptations this week? Should we talk about, were there any close calls that you had, any red flags that came up this week? Um, we'll talk about the activity log or if they didn't complete their homework. We'll talk about why didn't you complete your homework? What got in the way of you completing your homework? The activity log, we'll, we'll talk about, I have an example of that in just a couple of slides. Um, we'll talk about, do you have anything coming up in the next couple of weeks, in the next few months? Um, or maybe they have a wedding that they have to go to, or maybe a family visit, or maybe they're starting a new job, right? We can start focusing on some of those things. Um, oftentimes, especially clients that are dealing with um, substance abuse disorders are not really able to identify high risk situations. They don't really know that it's a problem until it becomes a problem. Um, we'll also talk a lot about the CBT cycle of addiction or what, what we'll call the proximal model. <clears throat> so we're going to use Joe as an example. Um, this is, we obviously changed, I changed his name for confidentiality. Um, but Joe is a 55-year-old married male. Um, this is a real patient that I, that I worked with in the past. Um, he works full-time from home. He has three children in high school. He had his first drink when he was 10 years old. Um, prior to treatment, Joe was drinking a handle of scotch every two to three days. Um, he never experienced any withdrawal symptoms, right? This is key. And this actually became a very interesting part of his treatment because he never really had an issue waking up in the morning, feeling hungover, um, never had any withdrawal symptoms, liver is functioning perfectly fine, brain function is perfectly fine, um, was always able to go to work, right? Meanwhile, he's drinking a handle every couple of days. So you would think this guy is, you know, really has, getting sick in the morning and having some periods of um, some pretty severe uh, withdrawal, but he just, he didn't. Um, he has a history of anxiety and depression. Um, he's got current marital strain. His wife had an affair um, and he's got some strain with these relationships with his kids. And his longest period of sobriety was a year. And that was several years prior to coming into treatment. And he, he had that period of sobriety because he um, challenged himself to see if he could stop drinking. And he did for a year. And then he went back to it. This was his first attempt in therapy. He never had therapy before. And when he started therapy with me, he had just started a trial of naltrexone. This is something that you're all very familiar with, um, the stages of change. So the, the piece here that I'll highlight is step number six, right? We all know pre-contemplation, you're unaware, unmotivated, contemplation, um, preparation, action, maintenance. But this sixth step of relapse, this is really where CBT starts coming into play. Because the idea of all or nothing thinking, which we identify as a thinking error, can start that cycle all over again. So it's important when we're looking at these stages of change that when we're doing this education on it with our patients about the stages of change, what exactly happens when you relapse? Now what, right? So uh, if you read on, um, there's a book on motivational interviewing from uh, Miller and Rolnick. They wrote a book specifically about um, what happens. There's a lot of information in there about how to motivate that patient and kind of getting to where that patient is. And do they go back into pre-contemplation? Do they go right back into action? Uh, and, and it's important to know that patients can reinsert themselves in any piece or any stage and step in this process throughout their, their recovery. So here's the meat of really what we're trying to understand for um, CBT, our automatic thoughts, right? We wanna be able to know what are these patients thinking? What are the patients, what's going on? This idea that, well, I'm happy, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna drink. I'm sad, so I'm gonna drink. I'm, um, I'm angry, so I'm gonna drink. And I'm just gonna use drinking throughout this because this is Joe's example. Um, so if we're identifying, the very first thing that we'll wanna do is identify what are these automatic thoughts that these clients are having? And often these automatic thoughts are the, the window into the soul of the core belief, right? This is the meat of really where we want to go with any treatment, but specifically with CBT. So for example, you have a situation, uh, maybe Joe's working on some home repairs, right? His automatic thought, this is an automatic thought, meaning it's the very first thing that comes into your mind, right? If I stub my toe, 
on the desk, my automatic thought's going to be out, right? If I'm driving down the highway and I get ran off the road by somebody that I see is texting and driving, um, and now I'm sitting in a ditch, my automatic thought is probably not going to be something very nice, right? My emotion, I'm going to be angry. So in this case, Joe is working on his home repairs and he's having an automatic thought he can use a drink and then he feels happy about that. And that that's something that will really hone in on in the first couple of sessions is getting at what are those automatic thoughts and how many times during the week are you having these automatic thoughts that you're not aware of. They're drilling down even deeper. We have a situation leads us to having an automatic thought and then it leads us to having a reaction. So in the beginning when Dr. Beck developed this model, right, this conceptualization model of, of CBT, he looked at a situation, he looked at an automatic thought, and then he called it a behavior. About five-ish, maybe six years ago, um, they said, wait a minute, the, but the behaviors actually come in three different methods, three different um, reactions, right? We react emotionally, we react behaviorally, and we have a physi physiological response. Well, what does that mean? So if Joe is working on these home repairs, he's having an automatic thought that I need a drink, and then he's having an emotional or reaction. Um, his emotion is he's happy, he feels relief. Um, his behavior, he pours himself a shot, and then his response is that he's calm and he's relaxed. This is something important for clients to start to understand. This is beginning this conceptualization of cognitive behavioral therapy, right? Of understanding that I have a situation, it led me to have an automatic thought, and now I'm having some type of reaction. Patients don't always have a physiological response. They don't always have a behavioral response. Sometimes they just have an emotional response, right? But this helps us understand what different reactions our clients are going to have. So some tools and techniques that are most heavily relied on when uh, working with clients, not just with um, addictions, but these are kind of my go-tos. And, and every CBT therapist that you come across, they might have their own um, toolbox that is going to be their most effective tools. These are the tools that I would like to share with you today um, because I think these are the most effective tools and I go back to them um, more often than not. Some of the other tools, um, they can be effective. There, there's a stack of tools this thick um, that you can use and, and really implement them in different ways. But this is really something that you can use across the board and included in that eclectic therapy approach that a lot of therapists do, especially when you're working in an outpatient setting, but you may not have that opportunity to just solely put a patient on a CBT track. So a thought record, um, we'll go over identifying automatic thoughts that we talked a lot about just now. We'll talk a little bit about testing our thoughts, modifying our thoughts, um, talk about the activity schedule, the importance of the activity schedule. We'll talk a little bit about delaying and distracting, um, cost-benefit analysis, huge. I use this almost every single session in some capacity. We'll always talk a lot about that cost-benefit analysis, um, rely very heavily on role plays, and then um, out of the three types of exposures, and I'll, I'll mention some of those later, um, with, with dealing with addictions, we rely heavily on that imaginal exposure. So this is an example of a thought record. This is something very early in treatment that I'll assign my clients to, to for homework, right? So we'll want to understand, we want to capture that situation, we want to capture this automatic thought, we want to capture an emotion, and we want to capture a response. This is actually a modified thought record. A traditional thought record will actually have several other columns. Um, we'll use that much later in treatment. And if you're um, doing some type of a um, experiment in terms of a research project, that's going to be the, the model that you're going to want to adapt. This seems to be um, equally efficient with clients. And sometimes I find that that longer model just overwhelms them. So a lot of clinicians will take this um, condensed model of this modified thought record. And this is something that um, we'll give to our clients and they'll take it with them throughout the week. So what we want to do is we want to capture situations. We want to capture what their first automatic thought was. We want to capture that emotion and what response they had. Not so much specifically, was it emotional, behavioral, 
um, physiological. We just want to know exactly what happened, right? We're just trying to get the client to draw some attention as to what happened in their week. So this is an example. Um, it's a Thursday night, right? And automatic thought is Friday, let's the Friday Eve, tomorrow's Friday, one more day of work, let's celebrate. And then he feels happy, he has a drink. Tuesday, there's a snowstorm, gym is closed. Gym is one of our distraction techniques that we talked about. Well, that sucks, might as well drink then, right? He's annoyed, he's irritated, he drinks. Um, another situation, wife's homework, for, uh, home late from work, his automatic thought, here we go again. Um, he feels jealous, hurt, angry. And then he questions his wife when he gets home and he has an argument, but he doesn't drink that night. Then he has an argument with his wife, has an automatic thought, I should have left her. He feels angry, used and embarrassed. He decides he's gonna go for a, gym, a swim. Um, first time at a new gym, Joe also has a pretty severe anxiety disorder. Um, so he's feeling automatic thought, I don't know what I'm doing. Everyone's looking at me, everyone's judging me. I feel anxious. And then he ends up completing the workout and goes home and, and gets ready for work. Um, Joe, Joe likes to go to the gym either very early in the morning or he goes at night. Um, next situation, he burns dinner. I suck as a cook, he gets angry, he's annoyed, and he ends up having a drink. So when we look at um, testing these thoughts, right, we kind of go back to, all right, well, now we've got the automatic thought. Now we know what is happening. Now we've got some insight into our behaviors. We know what, what our responses are. And we, we know that if I have these automatic thoughts, well, now I've got them. Well, now what, right? Now, what do we do with them? Now I, I know that I'm, I'm going to have some house chores to do. I know I like to drink when I'm doing those house chores. I feel happy when I'm buzzed. And I have this belief that I just can't, I can't get my chores done without drinking. So we start testing these thoughts. We start modifying these thoughts. So this is a tool that I use almost, almost every session we'll use a testing our thoughts, right? This is where your clients are going to start to be developing um, that new belief system. And they're going to be testing out some of these thoughts that they have to see if they think that they're true or not. So when I asked Joe in the very beginning of treatment, if I said to him, well, He's having this thought, um, I can only drink when I, I can only complete my house repairs when I'm drinking. I'll say to him, well, what percentage true do you think that is, right? Well, Joe comes back to me and he says, I'm 90% sure I can only do home renovations when I'm drinking, right? When I've had, I don't know, five or six shots, eight shots. Those are the only times that I'm able to be successful. I can't even get off the couch and do something. Um, and he has a whole list of reasons as to why um, he feels that this 90% true that he can't do anything in his house without drinking. So we'll test out that thought. So his old thought process, um, and, and I should have put in here, his old thought process is that he um, can only do his house renovations and his house chores while he's drinking. His new thought process might be something like, well, let's test it out and see, see if there's something else that, that you can actually do. So situation, he plans to install new windows in his house. His thought or his image, um, image I included in there because if you have a patient that has anxiety, oftentimes it's happening in images. So it's not just thoughts. A lot of our patients are, um, they're, they're mistaking thoughts for images. So they might be having these scenarios or these images that are going on in their mind and they're not quite identifying them as thoughts. So when you're assigning some of these different assignments to them, it's important that you give them that opportunity to record those images as well. Um, so Joe's thought is, I can't work on, on home repairs without a buzz. So my next question to Joe is, well, what evidence do you have to support that this image is true? Um, he says, well, every home project that I've completed, I've been drinking. Okay. Uh, maybe he has, you know, 25 other, and this is just an example. And Joe has multiple reasons as to why um, he, he feels like he can't support, uh, he has evidence to support that he, um, he can only do these projects when he's drinking. So then I'll ask him, well, what is some evidence to support that this image is not true? He says, well, I work from home right? And I'm sober during my day job. 
and I'm able to get through the day. So I, I guess I can be functional at some level during the day without drinking, right? Because I usually typically don't start drinking until I get out of work. Um, so maybe there's, maybe there's some hope there that I can get these new windows installed in my house without, without drinking. Then I'll ask him, what are some alternative ways to view the situation? What's the new modified thought, right? This, this becomes the behavioral experiment. Well, I don't have to drink when I'm working at home on projects. Okay, well, what's the worst case scenario if you don't drink when you're working at home on projects? What's the worst case scenario if you try not to drink when you're working on these windows in your house? I drink. All right, well, what's the best case scenario? I don't drink. What do you think most likely will happen? I think I'm gonna end up having a couple of shots. Maybe I'm not gonna have 10 to 12 shots, but maybe I'm gonna end up having one to two shots. So my last question to Joe would be, if you were giving this advice to your friend in a similar situation, um, what, what do you think you would tell him or her? And he says, well, I would tell them, why don't you go ahead and start the project without drinking and see how it goes? Because now we know we have this worst case scenario that you're gonna drink. You've got a best case scenario that you're not gonna drink. And you have a most likely case scenario that you might drink a couple of shots. Now we've turned it into a behavioral experiment because now we have Joe agreeing to start this project and to see what's going to happen and to prove if his most likely case scenario comes true, if his best case scenario comes true, and if his worst case scenario comes true. So then at the end of this, I'll ask him again. So based on this evidence, what percentage of you think that you'll be able to go through your evening or your weekend and put these install, install these windows in your house and not drink? Then he says, well, maybe 50%. Okay, I'll take it, right? You went down from I'm 90% sure I can't do it to I'm 50% sure I can't do it. We'll run a behavioral experiment and we'll end up seeing what that number goes to. Um, for one session, that's probably enough, right? In the subsequent follow-up sessions, if Joe's been in therapy for a while, I may push him a little bit and say, well, all right, 50% of the case, you're going to say, I'm 50% confident that I can do this without drinking, I'll say, well, what's the other 50% getting in the way, right? So we'll drill down, we'll continue drilling down and trying to understand specifically what it is that Joe is having difficulty with and why is it that he still thinks that he has to drink um, when he's doing these home renovations. This is an activity log. Um, this activity log is one of the most important tools that I think anybody can use as a clinician. Um, and this is important and I use it in multiple different, different ways. Sometimes I'll have a patient use it if they're depressed um, to kind of walk through their day and actually see how many hours of the day they're sitting in front of the TV and doing nothing. Sometimes I'll have them use it to record cravings, right? So I'll say, all right, well, it's, it's Monday and it's 8 a.m. and I'm having a craving and my craving is at an eight, right? So I'll wanna make sure that um, I get some understanding of how many days in the week is, is my client having these cravings or when they're depressed or when they're anxious. And sometimes I'll have them record situations and sometimes we won't. Sometimes we'll use it and specifically for addictions, We'll use it in a way of, well, let's start using this as a tool to plan out your day to see what's going to happen and where we can plug in some alternative methods or measures to help prevent you from using. Um, one, one thing that when I was in training that they would assign um, when they first introduced this activity log, our homework for that day um, was to actually go home and log our whole entire evening from hour to hour of what we were doing. And most of the time, um, over 50% of the class came back in and they didn't have the assignment completed. Um, and that's because it is so difficult to put every single thing that you're doing in a time slot throughout the week or throughout a day. Imagine being a patient that's depressed or anxious. And then now you've got to figure out, oh my God, I have to do this activity log. So expect that when your patients come back in with their activity log, it's going to have gaping holes in there, right? That's okay. 
sometimes we'll take this activity log and we'll use it as a simulation in session so they can go home with this working document in front of them, right? And this, this might be something that, um, this is where you plug in some things that they're gonna help, they're gonna do to decrease their, their uh, they're gonna decrease their uh, possibility of, of drinking or using. So this is an example of Joe again. Um, and I just, again, when I give this out as an assignment um, and on the website, you'll have a 24 hour rolling worksheet. This is just kind of a snippet of what one piece of Joe's day looks like. Um, and, and he was in treatment for a while. So this is sort of nearing maybe the, the beginning middle of his treatment. So you can see um, Sunday, it's two o'clock in the afternoon and Joe starts having a craving and he's at about a seven, pretty high. He decides he's gonna go to Home Depot and we know that Joe has a rule that he doesn't drink and drive. And then he goes to stop and shop and one of his um, distraction techniques that we'll talk about in a little while um, is that he brushes his teeth and he ends up having dinner, his craving notice goes down to a four and then he ends up reading in bed. Um, Monday rolls around, he's feeling some stress at work, three o'clock in the afternoon. He's got a craving, it's about a nine. He ends up smoking pot during the day while he's working. Um, and then he goes swimming, brushes his teeth, has dinner, goes to bed. So you can kind of get an idea of, of how this looks and what it will look like when you have a client that is actively engaged in treatment and they're kind of listing all of this out. Like again, some of these um, will go out of the office with it 50% of the way filled in. So we kind of know what time of day they're gonna have dinner. We know that on Sunday afternoon, maybe Joe has to run to Home Depot and stop and shop. And we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna schedule that in there at three o'clock and four o'clock. Um, we know that Joe swims on Friday nights from six to seven. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna put that in there. Same with on Tuesday. We know Joe swims from six to seven on Tuesday. So we can go ahead and put that in there. Um, and we also know that Joe tries to get to bed um, about eight o'clock. Um, so on Saturday, Joe wakes up in the morning. He's got a craving at about an eight. He pours his first drink at three o'clock and four o'clock he starts his home chores, had another three plus nips at dinner. And then he drinks more and by eight o'clock that night he ends up passing out. So you'll start to see a trend. Um, this is also important at week after week, you'll start to notice the trends. And part of cognitive behavioral therapy is that it's data-driven we want to start understanding these trends. We want to start understanding what exactly is it that these patients are doing throughout the week so we can start to figure out, well, is it just around dinner time that they're having um, some issues? Is it the afternoon they're starting to have some cravings? What exactly is going on with this patient? This is an example of a blank cost benefit analysis um, and it'll make a little bit more sense on this slide. Um, so this is a, this is actually Joe's cost benefit analysis. Um, and this is one of the first things that we'll do in session in terms of identifying some of the goals. So Joe came in and he was really on the fence about, I don't know if I want to abstain from drinking hundred percent, or if I want to use a harm reduction approach, right? Harm reduction approach, telling us that anything under 14 drinks for a male in a week um, is considered within limits. Um, according to, to kind of our studies of what we know is um, beyond that becomes harmful to our brain, our body, our organs, our liver. Um, so Joe is looking at, am I going to choose harm reduction or am I going to choose abstinence? So we start walking through, what are the advantages of harm reduction versus the disadvantages of harm reduction? And what are the advantages of abstinence versus the disadvantages of abstinence? So Joe says, well, if I choose harm reduction, I can still have a drink. I can feel normal at social events. I can still enjoy the taste of scotch, which is what he likes to drink. I can have a drink with dinner. I don't have to feel deprived, helps me socialize, relaxes me, um, helps renovations at home more fun. And it means that I'm not an alcoholic, right? This was a very important piece for Joe is that, that idea that he was gonna be identified as an alcoholic. And then we'll ask Joe, well, what are the disadvantages of harm reduction? He says, well, I may overdrink, right? It's gonna be really hard to stop at one or two drinks. We're gonna continue having some cravings, gonna continue on 
impacting my anxiety and my depression. We know that alcohol impacts the anxiety and the depression, especially within the first 72 hours after your last drink. And we know that my wife will always be monitoring my, my alcohol consumption. And then we take a look at um, advantages of abstinence, right? Well, what, what is it that's good about abstaining? I won't have a temptation to drink. I'll be healthier. I won't pass out, right? My wife's gonna get off my back. I'll set a good example for my kids, I'm gonna save some money. Um, eventually, maybe my cravings will go away. I'm gonna be less anxious and less depressed and I'm gonna sleep better. And then we talk about his disadvantages of abstinence. Um, won't be able to taste scotch, going to be anxious in social situations, right, which for some patients just absolutely takes it off the table. Um, I, I'm going to feel like an outcast, going to have to identify and people are going to think something's wrong with me. I'm going to be cranky all the time. I won't be able to relax and I'm going to have to identify as an alcoholic. And that means that I'm not in control of my actions. So sometimes when you're doing a cost benefit analysis with a patient, um, they, it'll be clear cut, right? This will be, you'll have very clear in, in identification of, you know, there's maybe 15 reasons on one side and three on the other, and it's a no brainer. But in Joe's case, it's really not that clear cut. So what does this exactly tell us about Joe's beliefs, right? It tells us that if I can't manage my alcohol consumption, then that means I don't have control over my actions, right? And these are what we call conditional assumptions. It's these if then statements that start to form in our patients' minds. Um, I need alcohol to socialize, right? A core belief. I need alcohol to relax and unwind, another core belief. If I can't drink, then I will feel deprived, a conditional assumption leading up to a core belief. If I can't drink, then I'm not normal, right? Another conditional assumption leading up to our core belief. So what we wanna use is a technique of downward houring. We wanna be able to take one of those thoughts, right? And you can downward, downward hour, arrow for any one of those thoughts that he has. So we chose, I chose this for an example. If I can't manage my alcohol consumption, then that means I don't have control over my actions. Well, why, well Joe, why is that bad, right? I'll ask him. Well, if I have no control over my actions, well, then that means I'm weak. Okay, and why is that bad? If I'm weak, then I can't be a good husband and I can't be a good father. And why is that bad? If I can't be a good husband or a father, then I'm useless, right? Now we're getting to the meat. Well, if I'm useless, then I might as well not be here. Well, what, what do you mean by that? Well, if I'm not, if I might as well not be here, well, then maybe I should just kill myself, right? Well, well why is that bad? If I kill myself, then I'm a failure. Right. So it ends up we have a negative core belief that we've just discovered and identified. Joe's major core belief behind a lot of what's going on in his life is I am a failure. Right. And so he he has multiple negative core beliefs. All of that work that we've just gone through led us to just this one core belief. Well, now what do you do with it? Now you've got this negative core belief. Um, so now we've got a very good opportunity to set up a, a, a behavioral experiment. The behavioral experiment being, well, let's test out those thoughts, right? What's the situation? The situation goes back to that testing and modifying thoughts slide of, and again, you can find a lot of these on my website, which, which is on the last slide. Um, some of these tools are listed there. If we're gonna test our thoughts, well, what evidence do we have to prove that you're a failure? Um, he's going to give you his reasons. What evidence do you have to prove that you're not a failure? Um, and what what do you think that would be the worst case scenario if you were to think differently, right? If you were to change your thinking, what exactly would that be? What's the worst case scenario if you think that you're not a, fa a failure? What might happen? What's the best case scenario that might happen if you think you're not a failure? What's the most likely case scenario that's going to happen? And if you're giving advice to a friend, what advice might you give to your friend? So during this, you're going to be collecting the evidence. We're going to be having him fill out a thought record, right? And then we're going to start modifying these negative core beliefs. And that negative core belief is going to be, I am not a failure. And we're going to start building evidence to prove that Joe is not a failure. So 
looking at CBT and looking at where it intervenes, right? So now we've got all of these examples and you can use these examples and you can kind of plug and play them in many different areas when you're using CBT with a client. Um, but specifically, where does CBT intervene with, um, with addictions? Um, it, it, it intervenes in these high-risk situations, the proximal model that we'll go through. It intervenes with some dysfunctional beliefs about drinking drugs and yourself. It intervenes with automatic thoughts. It intervenes with cravings and urges. It intervenes with your permission giving beliefs and it intervenes with your behaviors and your rituals. So this is the proximal model of abuse and you probably have seen a slide like this before. So we look at a high risk situation. We look at what the expectation is that the client has. We plug in the automatic thought. We plug in a craving. And then we talk about that very critical self permission giving belief we talk about our reactions and our behaviors, and then we talk about our relapses and our slips. So an example, if Joe was going to slip, might look like, well, I have plans to work on my house, um, my expectation, I want to relax and unwind, my automatic thought, I would love a drink, my craving is out of seven, and my permission-giving belief becomes, well, if I grab a nip on the way home, no one's really going to know. So what does Joe do? Joe goes to Home Depot and he stops at the package store on his way home, right? He has two nips before he walks in the door and now he's ready to do his, his home repairs and he has slipped in this, this cycle of relapse. Now, if he wanted to sustain recovery and he wanted to choose that he wanted not to drink, there's really not much that changes in this model outside of that permission giving belief and the reaction. So Joe, again, he has these plans to work on his home repairs. And this is something that we do together in session. And we would possibly walk through something like this for every single possible situation that Joe might be going through. Um, his idea of expectations is that he wants to relax and he wants to unwind. He has this automatic thought that I would love a drink. He still has a craving of a seven, but he gave himself a different permission giving belief. And that permission giving belief started to become, and this is where the modification of the thought comes in, right? I'm not a failure. And I know I'm not a failure because if I have a few nips, it's going to lead me to having more drinks at home, right? So if I don't have more drinks at home and I sustain recovery, then I didn't fail. And so now he takes a different route home and he installs a new window without drinking. This is the idea of building the social core beliefs, modifying the beliefs and building evidence that these clients are going to prove to themselves that they have this power, right? Going back to one of those initial slides of I'm powerless over my addiction. I have the power to decide that I'm not going to choose to drink today. So some high risk situations um, that we can use CBT and the, the different um, techniques that you can use. And again, you can use this are great for um, putting in a group setting. They're great for using on individual. They're great for prescribers. They're great for really anybody that you're going to be um, having contact with a patient and you can use these and plug and play throughout their treatment. Um, that activity log, you can target with that activity log just one specific day and focus on one specific day. Sometimes it's just way too overwhelming to give a client an entire activity log and tell them, fill this out for the week, come back next week and tell me how you did. Um, sometimes we'll say, okay, we know that you have um, a stressful day coming up on Tuesday. Let's walk through just Tuesday and let's walk through what we think it's going to look like. And then let's plug it into the proximal model of abuse. And let's walk through what it's going to look like if you choose to give yourself a permission giving belief to continue using, or if you choose to give yourself a permission giving belief that you're going to sustain sober, right? Then we'll, we'll walk through testing thoughts, and then we'll do something with an imaginal exposure. Um, exposures are something interesting with CBT. So exposure therapy is something that we use in CBT, especially with um, any type of obsessive compulsive personality, obsessive compulsive disorders, obsessive compulsive personality disorder, um, really any of those, those cluster of personality disorders. Um, we'll use it almost always with um, anxiety disorders. It is really the number one treatment for anxiety disorders and for depression. Um, imaginal exposure is something that is the most effective for 
um, substance abuse, because obviously um, there's still, there's three types. Let me back up for a second. There's three types of exposure. So one first exposure is called an in vivo exposure. That's when you're putting a person in the actual situation. Um, another exposure is the imaginal exposure. And then a third exposure is called an interceptive exposure. Um, and in vivo exposure, if somebody is shooting heroin, obviously we're not gonna wanna put them in a position where they're around people that are shooting heroin, their likelihood of relapse is gonna be pretty high. Um, but we do wanna walk them through what it might be like to be in a situation where they are around people that are shooting heroin, right? Or that they are at a party where there's cocaine or there's drinking. Um, and that's an example of what we may wanna take out that proximal model of abuse or we wanna take out that activity log and we wanna walk them through that experience, that exposure. If you're going to engage in that imaginal exposure with a patient, you're gonna to wanna to get them to identify as much, very, as graphic and as much information as you can possibly get them to put out in that session, right? You wanna know exactly in that imaginal exposure, where are you going? Who are you going with? What car are you getting in? What color car is it? What are you wearing? Um, what time are you going? Who's gonna be there? What kind of food is there? Um, where, what kind of music is playing? Every single piece of that imaginal exposure that you can walk them through. So think about it almost like a guided imagery that you're gonna do during the session. And then a homework for an imaginal exposure might be for the client to commit to doing um, three imaginal exposures that week. Or maybe they wanna say, I can do an imaginal exposure every day during the week. Um, the interceptive exposures, I, we can get to that if we have some time at the end of the, um, at the end of the slides. So dysfunctional beliefs, right? What are some of these dysfunctional beliefs? Most often, you've all heard these before, right? Heroin is not my drug of choice. A drug of choice. I can still use cocaine, right? How often have we heard that? Well, I, I don't have a problem with cocaine, so what's the problem? Um, pot's not addictive, so if I smoke a couple of times a day, that's, that's not a problem. Right? I can drink because drinking isn't a problem for me. Heroin's my problem. Um, or vice versa, right? Well, I, I, can, I can shoot a bag of dope, right? Why not? I, my drug of choice is alcohol, not, not, there, not heroin. Um, my boyfriend deals, so at least I know where it's coming from and I'm not gonna die. How many times have we heard that? How many times have we had overdoses from that? Um, I can't hang out with my friends if I'm not high. Right, I this is this is a lot of the social anxiety piece. Well, I can't go to a party if I'm not if I'm not high. How am I going to function? And then another one that we kind of get very often, especially when you have a history of um, this genetic predisposition within a family. Everyone in my family is a drunk, so it's my destiny to be drunk. So what do we know about cravings and urges? Right, we know that, and we'll spend some time talking about patients with on this specific piece, right, about cravings and urges, because a lot of times they have dysfunctional beliefs about cravings and urges. Well, if I use, then my cravings will go away. No, well, yeah, they'll go away until you have another craving, right? And what do we know about cravings? We know that when you use, you have a craving, and when you have a craving, you have a use, and when, when you have a craving, we also know that an average craving lasts 7 to 21 minutes. So Sometimes we'll pinpoint what do we do during those seven to 21 minutes and we'll do a behavioral experiment around looking at, can I get through some of these cravings to see if I can get a couple of days or put a couple of hours even together of not using. So we have this in an inevitable progression of, well, if I use them, my cravings will go away, which is the dysfunctional belief. And then we have the sort of data driven, well, I know that if I use, I'm gonna have cravings and cravings equals use. So now I'm stuck in this cycle. And so if I follow that, I have this inevitable progression, inevitable progression. But if I try some of these CBT skills and I do a behavioral experiment and I use testing my thoughts and I use an activity log, right? Or modifying my thoughts or um, a understanding my situation, my automatic thought, my, my feelings and then my reaction, now we have proof to use with the client during session to see what actually happens, okay? Permission giving beliefs, right? Some of these, these permission giving beliefs, the top permission giving beliefs that we all have heard umpteen times, no one will ever know, right? 
Well, the reality is most likely everybody knows, right? They're just able to tell themselves, no one will know. Um, just this time, right? It's just pot. It's my graduation day. I deserve a drink. It's a Tuesday in July, right? We can go on and on and on about these permission giving reliefs and they are endless. So what we wanna be able to capture is having these clients keeping a running list and that might be something that you're doing in session. And sometimes what I'll do with my clients is we have this sort of document that's living and breathing and we keep adding these permission giving beliefs, right? So it kind of almost becomes like a multiple choice when they come into session and they give me one of these permission giving beliefs, we're able to identify, is that a negative permission giving belief or is that a positive permission giving belief? So they draw some understanding to why is it that when I have a thought and then I have an emotion, and I'm linking it to a reaction, it's not my emotion that's giving me the reaction or making me um, kind of act out on that reaction. It's actually the situation that's putting me there. And more importantly, it's my automatic thought, which is my permission giving belief. Because most of the time, when you're having these situations around using substances, automatically that automatic thought is the permission giving belief, right? You go to a party, there's marijuana there and uh, they're in recovery from, you know, heroin. Well, it's just pot. I can use that, right? So situation, I'm at a party, there's marijuana, automatic thought, it's just pot. The feeling might be relief because it's just pot. And then the reaction is that they end up smoking. Another important piece is understanding the behaviors and the rituals, right? Using paraphernalia, big, big, big understanding there. I had a client that um, I used to treat and his big, uh, big relapse, his one area of relapse was using the paraphernalia, right? His obsession, his love, his grief, that grief that we had to kind of walk through with this client was actually watching, pulling the blood back into the syringe when he was shooting up, right? That was the one piece that he had a very hard time getting through. And we don't want to minimize that ritual, the ritualistic behavior of using, right? Specifically around the paraphernalia. Um, listening to certain music. Some people will say, you know, I can't listen to any music that I heard at the festival because that's going to just make me want to use again. Going to a specific location. Um, calling or texting a specific person, right? Sometimes if they're going to cop, they are, they've got those numbers so memorized in their head. If it pops up in their mind, that's it. They're off and running, right? Certain day a week, an event, certain time. We want to be able to understand in CBT, what are these behaviors and these rituals? Again, it's an opportunity to run a behavioral experiment for any, every single one of these different rituals and behaviors that are engaged in they're engaging in, in using substances. So this is another example of Joe. Um, Joe, we decided we were gonna look at some delaying and distracting techniques. This is something that you can use, again, in an individual session, you can use it in a group session, um, obviously the activity log, and I, these are some examples of some of the rules that we came up with with Joe. So Joe ended up deciding that he was going to go on the harm reduction route. So we said, all right, you're going to go on a harm reduction route. Let's make some rules. Our rules are no weekday drinking, um, no drinking until after I work out at night. So that's where that swimming came into play, right? Because if we can delay the start of that drinking, then maybe the likelihood of him drinking more that night is going to be less. Um, I'm going to sip. I'm gonna actually get a scotch glass out. I'm gonna pour myself a glass of scotch. I'm not gonna just shoot a nip, right? I'm gonna call it a drink versus a shot. Joe likes to call it a shot. He referred to everything as shots. We want that public commitment of having a drink, right? So now Joe decided he's not gonna hide the bottle, even though he's gonna get some slack from his wife, he's gonna leave it out in, in plain sight because he wants to draw that public commitment to his drinking. And he's also gonna start calling his shots a drink, right? Call it what it is. His distractions, he decided that brushing his teeth makes his cravings go away. We ran a behavioral experiment around that. And that's how we came up with that, that distraction on his list. Um, he realized that if he drinks apple cider vinegar, right? For some reason, Joe liked to drink apple cider vinegar and it sort of 
he liked because again, the ritualistic and the, the feeling of that burn in his throat when he drank the scotch was something he liked. So he substituted it for the apple cider vinegar and it ended up becoming a distraction for him um, on days that he noticed that he was craving, he would have some apple cider vinegar and it would move him away from drinking. Um, he decided he was gonna go swimming in the evenings versus in the morning again, because his rule was I'm not drinking and driving. And if I come home at seven o'clock at night and I know I go to bed about eight, I only have an hour of time that I'm playing with him there. And the likelihood of me drinking um, more, more than you know, maybe one drink in that time period is, is less than if I have three hours. He was gonna plan to run his, evening, his errands in the evening. Um, he was gonna start to read a new book and he started planning to go out to dinner with his family at night. Again, that distraction and delaying the start. So some other interventions, um, role-playing, the imaginal exposure we talked about, and a safety plan. Um, role-playing is, is a good one. That's something that um, I use a lot with my clients, right? So we'll talk about role-playing. Um, and in that sense, and sometimes some therapists get really caught up in the fear of role-playing or they don't like getting into that character. But for CBT, it's important. It's important for two, on two fronts. One, we want to play the role of the client. We want to play the role of the therapist and we want to play the role of the person that they are talking to in that role play, right? So if they're having an um, interaction with their spouse and it's a heated, ugly interaction, we want to make sure that we play the role of the spouse and then we want to play the role of the client. Um, so they can understand and see the different takes on how you as a therapist are going to be modifying and responding and replaying a situation and identifying different ways of having those conversations that the patient may not even be able to identify as a potential of even saying, right? So getting them very used to, again, exposing them to having these conversations um, and putting them in these situations is a big piece of CBT and understanding how to get them to that next piece. The imaginal exposure we talked about, and then, um, worst case scenario, we come up with a safety plan, right? If you're in a situation that you are going to be, if you're on, you know, probation or you're on parole and you, you know, one more time of a slip, you're going to end up um, back in jail. Or if you're on the methadone maintenance program, or if you're on Suboxone and you keep, um, you know, passing dirty urines, um, you're going to get kicked out of the program. So we'll come, we'll come up with a safety plan. So how in your, your when, how are you going to execute this safety plan? Um, who are you going to call? Kind of very much similar, similar to a safety plan if somebody's suicidal, right? What coping skills? What are the red flags first that you're going to know that you're in a danger zone? Um, what coping skills can you do on your own that you know when you're in a danger zone? If those fail, what do you do next? Is there somebody that you can call? Who is your therapist? Are you allowed to call them um, you know, after hours? Can you schedule a session? Um, and kind of walking through that, that plan for them. And sometimes that's enough to kind of keep them out of either getting kicked out of a program or going back to jail. So there are a lot of, and I know I kind of raced through a lot of this, there's just so much in the methodology of understanding cognitive behavioral therapy. This was a very small snippet of what it actually is to understand and use these different skills and techniques. Um, and really I could go on for days. Um, and unfortunately we have to be on Zoom um, if we were in person and had a longer period of time, you know, we could have demonstrated some of these role plays or um, had that, that benefit of doing that. But I would urge you to kind of get together with each other and walk through some of these different situations, um, take some of these tools out, um, print some off the website and take a look at um, a few of these other websites the Academy of Cognitive Therapy, um, and the Beck Institute, which is a great resource, um, and certainly on my website. So if you have any, any questions or you're interested in becoming trained or becoming a diplomat or taking classes, um, sometimes you, know, you can even do them in a bulk setting. Um, it's, it's really beneficial. And using these tools and techniques in terms of uh, making progress with your patients and seeing progress in a very short period of time, um, it's really one of the most effective tools that in my several years since practicing, since I was licensed in 1998, um, has been um, the most effective tools that, that I've seen today. Um, so that's 
what I have for presentation piece. Um, let's see. I'm going to the chat. So anybody have any questions that I can answer? Thoughts? No questions. Anything? Dr. Podolsky's, oh, wait, thank you. You're very welcome, yep, thank you. Can you speak a little more to the resistance? Oh, how do I stop it? Okay, wait. Can you speak a little more to the resistance to changing the permission giving belief? Yes. Um, so it's understanding the, the, the permission giving belief is a big piece, right? So when you have these different permission giving beliefs and you have patients that specifically went in the addictions realm, um, they are going, these permission giving beliefs are typically their monitor modeling after their core beliefs. So a lot of understanding that permission giving belief and changing it is gonna come from those behavioral experiments. Um, a lot of clients are gonna come in and they're gonna have these permission giving beliefs that are gonna be so deeply ingrained that penetrating into them and they're gonna look at you like you've got 12 heads, right? Like, what are you talking about? How, well, I'm not gonna drive a different way home from the store and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm I know that no one's ever going to know, and I know my wife isn't going to know, and I know that I deserve a, a drink, and I know I've been sober for three months, and I can use um, just this one more time. Those are traditionally reflections of that negative core belief, and once you get at that negative core belief and start understanding that negative core belief a little bit, um, that's when you're going to start to see some permissions giving beliefs change. That really comes with modifying your thought process. Um, sometimes it's really tough, right? There's an act as if um, tool that we'll use in CBT is kind of like, well, let's let's see, let's set this behavioral exper experiment up and let's act as if we believe it until we see if we have enough evidence to prove if we do believe it or not. Um, they still may really be resistant, right? It still may be very resistant to, um, I'm just not going to be able to get past this idea that no one's going to know, or it's just going to be this one last time. Eventually that will change, especially once they start engaging in some of these um, different techniques that you're using and they build their own evidence to see that that data that they've given to themselves is incorrect. 